Go ahead and have a seat. Thank you so much for doing that. Okay. Um, like they said on the video, we are in Acts part two, the sequel today. Um, and uh, as we turn this corner, I'm really going to get going. So hopefully you guys can kind of emotionally adjust into this space with me. Uh, but there's a lot to talk about today, um, and especially as we set this up. So back, if you were back with us in uh, January, February, we did Acts part one, and and there we did the first eight chapters in the book of Acts. And just so that you understand some context, um, the Gospels cover the time that Jesus did his ministry. And Jesus died on a cross for our sins, if you remember that. And he was risen from the dead and he ascended into heaven. And he set loose these 11 disciples, these 11 apostles on the ancient world and said, go start my church. Go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples and make churches and turn the world upside down. And they did. And Acts is the chronicle of how they did that. Um, it is the history book in the New Testament that shows us how all that stuff went down. And if you were there with us in those first eight chapters, you saw how the early church was born in Jerusalem and how they started to go out into Judea and into Samaria and into the ends of the, of the earth. Um, and wonderful players like Peter and John and, and Stephen and Philip and their different stories. We explored all of that. Um, we also saw a very interesting thing as the early church was born. And this is going to be a lot of our focus today was this issue of persecution started when the early church was born. Um, is a very interesting component of it. If you, if you look at it objectively and honestly is, um, I don't know if, if you look at the way that we are today, with religions. You can have somebody a completely different religion than you living next door in your house and you don't have to hate them, right? Like that's just, we're, we're kind of a live and let live kind of a society, especially when it comes to our religious beliefs and our, our philosophies. And that's part of, again, what makes this country, this culture great. Um, but it was not live and let live there in the early church. <clears throat> uh, when the church of Jesus Christ began and they started to spread the good news of Jesus there was a very hostile environment that they were um, being born into. And so the Jewish culture that was there and the Jewish religion that was there and the leaders there, they started to come against God's church. They even got violent about it. They would throw the apostles in prison. And that happened several moments. And even in chapter eight, when we ended la at the, the first part of the series, they had even killed Stephen, uh, an amazing evangelist amazing man of God. And, and if you could just take in for a second how young he was and how new the church was and what he would have accomplished for Jesus if he had lived a good long life. And that was all cut short. And of course, God was in that and allowed that to happen. But there was such a hostility against those folks in the early church. And even though there was that hostility, um, there was another viewpoint at the time uh, from a guy named Gamaliel. Gamaliel. Say it, Gamaliel. 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 <laughs> so Gamaliel was this rabbi and this Pharisee at the time. And, and in Acts chapter 5, Paul and John had gotten arrested and they got thrown in prison. And, and the Jews early on are trying to figure out what to do with this Jesus movement. And they don't know what to do with Peter and John. And uh, should we kill them or not? Like we killed Jesus, you know? And, and Gamaliel stands up in the middle of the Sanhedrin and he gives a differing opinion. And here's what he says. It's not on your screens. He says, so my advice is leave these men alone. Let them go. If they are planning and doing these things merely on their own, it will soon be overthrown. But if it is from God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You may even find yourselves fighting against God. So Gamaliel has the wisdom in that moment to say, not only is it live and let live when it comes to this kind of stuff, you don't have to be violent about it. But the other piece is, if you do go this more zealous and violent route, you may find yourself inadvertently fighting against God himself. Jesus even predicted this in uh, John chapter 16. He says, yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you, meaning the disciples, will think that he is offering a service to God. 
And there were radicals just like that. One of those radicals in the early church was a guy named Saul of Tarsus. And Saul was the chief opponent of the church, the chief persecutor of the, uh, of the early church. Even when Stephen was killed, he was the guy who stood by and approved the killing of Stephen. And so I've got a slide. We're going to do an overview of Saul here just real quick. My, my subtext there is Saul of Tarsus, not a great guy. Um, you'll see what I mean in just a second. Um, Acts chapter 8 verse 1 is when he approved of the killing of Stephen, the very first Christian martyr. In Philippians, and a lot of these descriptions come from Paul as he's sharing his testimony in his later life. He says that he was a Pharisee, and as far as zeal, he was the guy who was persecuting the church, the primary. In Acts 22, he says he studied as a Pharisee under Gamaliel. And you're like, well, why didn't you take Gamaliel's advice then, man? Um, But he goes his own way entirely, and he persecuted the followers of this way to their death. Acts 8, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Acts 26, he did all that was possible to oppose this new Christian movement in the name of Jesus Christ. Verse 10, he put many of the Lord's people in prison. And when they were put to the death, I cast my vote against them. And he's implying there, there were multiple Christians that he had put to death. And then verse 11, he tried to force them even to blaspheme. And he hunted them down. From, from foreign cities to foreign cities. So not, is he, not only is he going after their physical bodies, he's trying to trap Christians and force them to blaspheme, which is what? Which is him going after their soul. It's him trying to create a break between them and Jesus Christ under threat of physical harm. Not a great guy, amen? amen. Saul, not a great guy. Um, imagine yourself as a member of this early church and you find Jesus Christ and you get saved and your family gets saved and you're starting to go to church and everything is great and your life is changing like many people in this room you've experienced before, but there's also this very violent threat out there. And it's almost like the Nazi Gestapo. And it's like, if he shows up, if Saul shows up to your front door, it's bad. If you tell the wrong person at work about your faith and it gets around to Saul, it's going to be bad. If you're in the marketplace and this whole thing comes up and you're sharing your faith with somebody else and the wrong person overhears it, like it could be your life. It could be your whole family. That's the level of danger and threat the early church was under. And it's hard for us in our current culture to remember that. They were afraid of him. And what's in Saul's mind? Saul's mind is he absolutely believes this whole thing is a fad and he believes it's a fraud. He believes that Jesus Christ died on a cross and then Jesus Christ stayed dead. That's what Saul believes. He believes that anything about an empty tomb was disciples who went and stole his body in order to create a fraud. And he believes that everything that they're trying to start, it's probably for financial gain. They're trying to, start a, start, trying to start a movement, trying to make themselves big in culture. And what he believes at the end of the day is not only is this all a fraud, but it's against God. It's misleading God's people. And he's so furious and so passionate and zealous about it, he's willing to kill people. And that starts us in Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest and Saul requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way that he found there. And just pause real quick. Followers of the way, that's an early name, nickname that they gave to Christianity. Followers of the way. If you remember a few weeks ago, one of our I am statements was Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. One of those disciples was listening to that day, that day, amen? (laughs) Jesus said he's the way, so we're the followers of the way. Okay, where was I? That he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. And the implication is, and and then to stone them. Verse 3, as he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around Saul. 
And he's there with his entourage, right? Like they're helping him go. They're supporting him on the way to Damascus. And Saul fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who are you, Lord? He's so blinded by it. Who is this voice from heaven talking to me? And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Wait a second, you're supposed to be dead. Wait a second, this was supposed to be a fraud. And now all of a sudden you're alive and you're in heaven and you're talking to me. And in the next verse, he's also going to strike him blind. The men with Saul stood speechless, for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but saw no one. Verse 8, Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions had to lead him by the hand to Damascus, and he remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. So this strong man, this violent man, this passionate man, this capable man is all of a sudden he's down on the ground. And he's been leveled there by Jesus Christ himself. And he can't even get himself the rest of the way to Damascus. His entourage has to lead him by the hand. You want to talk about rendering this guy to a helpless place? He is, Jesus has seriously put him on ice. And then he goes to this spot in Damascus for three days and says, and he doesn't even eat or drink. And in a couple verses later that we're about to read, it's going to say that that entire three days he prayed. Well, who do you think he prayed to now? For three days, he's praying to Jesus. And what do you think? I mean, he's, he's not eating, he's not drinking, he's fasting, he's taking this all very, very seriously. He is crushed, he is devastated, and all of a sudden he's having a conversation with the one he thought was a fraud the one he thought was dead. And what do you think he's saying to him? Just ask yourself, please forgive me. Amen. I am, you've got to forgive me. How many times did he ask across three days, please forgive me? Next verse, verse 10. Now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision, calling Ananias. Yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, go over to Straight Street to the house of Judas. God is very specific sometimes in his directions, amen? amen. To the house of Judas. And when you get there, I want you to ask for this man from Tarsus named Saul. And he is praying to me right now. I have shown him in a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so that he can see again. Look at what he says next. Verse 13, 13. But Lord, but Lord. Have you ever said, but Lord? <laughs> I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And he is authorized by the leading priest to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. But the Lord said, go. That's what God thinks of his, but Lord. Go. For Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel, and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Ever have a but Lord moment? He just had one. God set him straight. Verse 17, so Ananias went and found Saul, and he laid hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, even saying Brother Saul, how did those words feel coming out of his mouth? Wow. <laughs> Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. And then he got up and he was water baptized. Afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength. Just real quick word on baptism. Last week, we had 14 people get baptized last week. Isn't that amazing? And three weeks before that, we had another baptism service. We usually don't do them that close together, um, but we just sensed God was 
moving. Three, 13 people got baptized that first, first time. So across the two Sundays in the last month, we have 27 people get water baptized here. Yep. Yep. That's just, that's God doing real work in individual hearts. Um, no one can create salvation for somebody else. That's a work of God. So Ananias comes to him and says, you're Jesus' chosen instrument. What, what, a, what a weird thing that must have felt like for him. Um, it, let in the idea just for a second, Ananias might have known Stephen personally. He might have known other Christian families that Saul had personally persecuted. This might have been deeply personal to him. It certainly was offensive that Saul was coming against his church and this movement. And Ananias is here calling him brother and, 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 and hearing words from God. And he's saying words from God like, like you're, you're, you're going to do things like God's giving you things to do, Saul. And you got to ask yourself like, okay, God, if you're so great, I could see you maybe saving Saul. And maybe forgiving his sins. And then how about we just fast forward that guy right to heaven? <laughs> but you're going to stop and you're going to make him an apostle? You're going to give him a ministry? And you're going to give him a great ministry? Amen. What do you got to do that for, Lord? Verse 20 Immediately, Saul began preaching about Jesus in the synagogue, saying, he is indeed the son of God. You hear it? <laughs> I can't believe it, but he really is the son of God. And he's telling his story. All who heard him were amazed. Isn't this the same man who caused such devastation amongst Jesus' followers in Jerusalem, they asked. And, and didn't he come here to arrest them and take them in chains to the leading priests? And Saul's preaching became more and more powerful. And the Jews in Damascus couldn't refute his proofs that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. So he was on this team and now he's on this team and it's immediate. And if you continue to read the rest of the chapter, I'm going to stop there because there's another passage I want to show you. But if you continue reading the rest of the chapter, and I highly recommend it, what you're going to find is the, the Jews in Damascus get so upset because so many people are converting to Christ now from Saul that they try to kill him. And then Saul has to leave. And there's a whole thing with the timeline. And some of you guys have studied that before, but he eventually ends up in Jerusalem and he wants to go meet the, the 12 disciples, the 12 apostles, and they don't want to meet him. And they're afraid to be in the same room with this guy. And a guy named Barnabas comes along, the son of encouragement. And Barnabas is like, I'll be the mediator between you. And he goes and he meets Saul and risks his life and gets to know that the conversion was real. And then he escorts him to the disciples and, and shows them that it's real. And, and that's the way that they finally meet. And Saul, who is renamed Paul at some point, he becomes a great Christian leader in the early church. And it's absolutely mind-blowing. And just to give you a, a sense of what he does from this point forward, he has 30 years of active ministry spreading the message and the gospel of Jesus Christ to others. It's, it's, it's crazy. He, he, uh, he sets off on three different uh, risking his life missionary journeys across the ancient world. And we think he planted between either 13 or 14 churches in the ancient world. And he might have planted even more. Out of the 27 books of the New Testament, 13 of them were written by Saul. And then he was ultimately arrested and imprisoned and ultimately killed for his faith. Oh, that is Saul. Not a great guy, Saul. I mean, even, even words that we take for granted that we have in our Bibles, you know, th th words like uh, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, that was written by Saul. Words like it is by grace you've been saved through faith and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God so that no, it's not by your works so that no one can boast. Saul's the one who wrote that. Love is patient. Love is kind. 
Saul wrote that. Love does not seek its own. It keeps no record of wrongs. Saul wrote that. Um, yeah. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Saul wrote that. I'm sure that one was personal to him, precious to him. But why choose Saul? What an odd choice. If you're in God's marketing team in heaven and you're thinking about the next strategic choice for who should be our poster child for Christianity, Saul is not it. (laughs) Ugly, mean, violent, evil Saul. He is not the choice. Um, I grew up watching the Jerry Lewis telethon. Anybody see that as a kid growing up? Um, some of you are just going to have to trust me. You're too young. Um, but, uh, it was muscular dystrophy and it was this disease, um, and it's super serious. And so people would raise money to help these kids that had it. And, and so here's what they would do is they would get the, the, of these kids that had muscular dystrophy, they would get the cutest one that they could possibly find. And, And here are some of them right, right there, right? Like we want the cute one. And put him on the stage with Jerry Lewis. Why? Because the cute ones are the ones that are going to stir our hearts. And we're going to get, want to give a whole lot of money to the MDA association. That's what makes sense. Uh, You you think even when people are trying to sell things, they want to get a good looking actor to be the spokesman for the thing that they're selling, right? Because that's what gets your attention. And, 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 And when the puppies are dying and we need to give money to the puppies and the song needs to come in and make us cry, it's like we're going to get cute puppies, yes? It's got to be cute puppies. And you got to focus in on their, their eyes. They're really, really big eyes. And you're going to give all your money there. Poster child, that makes sense. You don't choose ugly, evil Paul to be your poster child. But God did. <laughs> Upside down kingdom. Gosh. Uh, Saul actually uh, writes about this later on in the book of 1 Timothy. He kind of reflects back on why God saved him and what it was all about. Here's the second passage I want to take you through. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. He says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength to do his work. He considered me trustworthy and appointed me to serve him. Even though I used to blaspheme the name of Christ, in my insolence, I persecuted his people But God had mercy on me because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. Oh, how generous and gracious our Lord was. He filled me with the faith and love that came come from Jesus Christ. What's he saying there? He's saying, listen, God rescued me. Notice how much grace he's talking about, how much, how much mercy, how much gratitude he's got for what's been given to him. He has a clear eyed view of what happened to him. He was rescued. Because not only was he guilty of way more than anybody in this room is probably guilty of, but also he was so entrenched in his own beliefs. You don't save somebody like that. And we all know this. We've all had people that we know that are so entrenched in what they believe, you can't convince them otherwise. You can't give them another perspective. You can't hand them reading material and it possibly move them. They're just so entrenched in what they think and how they see the world. And that's the way that Saul was. You can't convince him. You can't rescue that guy. All of a sudden, three days later, he's out preaching that Jesus is real. Paul's like, I got to thank him because he poured out his grace on me. I'm a miracle walking around. And notice he says, just, just a real quick note, he says he did it in ignorance and unbelief. That is not him making excuses for himself. He is still guilty and he is still culpable. And you'll see that as the passage goes on. What he is reflecting is the words of Jesus Christ on the cross where Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Do you remember the rest? Because they know not what they do. Jesus himself looks out at all humanity and says, they don't know what they're doing. Even the ones of you who have sinned, and you're like, I knew what I was doing. Me too, by the way. 
we didn't really know what we were doing. And God, in his gracious perspective and his love for humanity, he says they didn't really know what they were doing. And I love that about him. Hallelujah. And so Paul is just, he's, he's falling right in line with that. In that verse 15, he says, this is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. That's a big statement. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst of sinners. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. So the first part we're going to go over, and then we'll do the second. First part we're going to go over is how in the world is Saul, Paul, the worst of sinners down through history? It's a big claim. And he makes that claim in scripture. So we need to take notice of it and not just read past it. He's, the, the, the actual word is that he is first in line. He is primary in line, protos. He is, he is right there as far as the, the line of sinners down through history. He's number one is the claim that he's making right there. And so think about it just for a second. Like how sinful was this guy? Well, he's murdering men and women, Yes. I mean, that's a pretty big deal. We don't know how many. We don't have a body count. He's, he's also trying to make people blaspheme Jesus. He's attacking people, their bodies. He's attacking families, and he's attacking their souls as well. Also, he's trying to destroy the church of Jesus Christ, he said. This, I believe, is the worst thing on the list, and that might surprise you. He's trying to destroy the church of Jesus Christ. Here's the thing. If Jesus is right, and he is, all of humanity has been struck with a disease called sin. And, does, and, and the disease, the sin, is actually killing us. It's killing our families. It's killing our churches. It's killing our communities. It's killing our world. And the only medicine against that disease is Jesus. Amen. It is his forgiveness. It's his wisdom. It's his love. It's the, the price he paid for us on the cross. It's Jesus. And Jesus gave the cause, gave the church to this ragtag bent bunch of people in the first century and said, go plant the church. And they were in their infancy, okay? They were vulnerable, and if Saul had had his way, he would have killed it. He would have snuffed it out. He would have snuffed out the only solution to humanity's problem for all time. Imagine if he would have gotten his wish. Imagine if he would have gotten his way. The spiritual devastation of that, you cannot calculate it. And that's what he was trying to do. And you're like, well, he didn't succeed. I get it. But we still put, put people in jail for attempted murder, yes? For those that attempt the thing, even if they fail at it, they still get consequence. There's still guilt for that. And so you just start adding up exactly what was he guilty of attempting to do? The worst thing imaginable, killing the church, killing the message. That's what he was trying to do. And if his heart was that, what a shock it must have been to him when that first, when that light bulb first went on for him. Wow. Was it during the three days? Was it revealed to him? You realize this is what you were trying to do. At what point did he realize he actually was the worst of sinners? And what was the weight of that like? And he's made peace with it because it doesn't pull him right down into the darkness every day of his life. Instead, he lifts it up and says, I'm the example. If God can save me, God can save anybody. Amen. So he sees the power and he sees the grace in it. But what a thing to have on your resume. Amen. And in verse 16, it says that he's the prime example hypotyposis. I think I pronounced that right. Who knows? Hypotyposis. He's the prime example. The, it's, a, it's a Greek word that, that essentially meant like an architectural sketch 
um, a picture, a display that other people could come to and say, this is what we're supposed to build. And Saul said, I'm the primary architectural sketch for the salvation of anybody else in the future. Look to me, he says, as an example, that if God can save me, God can save anybody. It reminds me of those carpet cleaner ads. Have you ever seen those? Where it's like they're trying to prove that their carpet cleaners are the greatest, or the greatest or their spot cleaner or whatever. And what do they always do? They always pour red wine on white carpet. Right? And you're like, ugh, you know, you know, like they do it, but then they clean it and everything's perfect all over again. I'm not sure if I believe it any time that it ever happens, but that's what they do, right? And why do they do that? They're trying to say the worst possible thing you can imagine, we can clean that. And if we can clean that, then we can clean anybody. Amen. And Saul said, God had a plan here. And he reached out and he rescued me in order to prove to the world down through the ages that if God could clean someone as stained as him, then God can clean you Amen. and God can clean me. I always talk to people who are like, uh, I believe in Jesus, but I can't believe he can forgive me. But I can't believe that what I've done and the lines that I've crossed and pastor, you don't know. And if you knew you'd feel different and nobody knows because nobody else was there, but I'm a special case and, and I might come as a Christian and I might, I might come and sit in your seats and be kind of ninja here. But really, I know I'm not really a part of this thing. I'm just kind of one of these fake ones sitting in the seat trying to make things better. But I'm not really going to heaven with the rest of you because I've crossed these lines and you don't get it. God can't save me. And you know what you've done? And I love you. But you've made your sin big and you've made God small. And you haven't meant to, but, but, but Saul comes in and he says, no, he's like, my sin was big, but God was bigger. Amen. And it's, it's not about trying to make our sins small. Like, let's face it. Let's talk about it. Let's be honest about what we've done. But God's bigger. And if God would do this with Saul, what will, what will he do with you? And if God could change Saul, if he could rescue Saul from his being entrenched, so entrenched, some of you are praying for somebody to find Christ and you've given up hope because you're like, I know them too well and they'll never change. They'll never turn. They'll never believe. They'll never leave their old life. So why pray for them anymore? Why hope for them anymore? Why, why invite them to church anymore? Guys, that's where Ananias was. Have faith. Have faith. Pray again, amen? Pray again. God could save Paul of Tarsus. Maybe he can save you. And then after those verses that he said where he called himself the great example, then he rolls into verse 17 and says, all honor and glory to God forever and ever. He is the eternal king, the unseen one who never dies. He alone is God. Amen. So does he get to that verse and say, you know what? I'm going to quote a hymn here. Heck no. What he did is he, he was so full of what God had done for him he burst into worship. He burst into gratitude. Because that what, that's what happens when you're not just writing a theological treatise. You're, you're actually feeling everything. You, you've lived everything that you're telling people. Is he's right in the middle of it, guys, and he bursts into song toward God. We were taught this song as kids, and I didn't even know where it came from. It came from right here, and it's in old King James. Now unto the King eternal. Now unto the king eternal, I'm going to sing it, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. They taught us that as kids. You Sunday school teachers, where are you at? I didn't even know where those words of worship came from. They came from the desperate heart of a man full of his own forgiveness. Can you imagine that? And he bursts into that. There's a time when Jesus is with Peter and Jesus gives him a miraculous catch of fish. Do you remember that? And his boat overflows and it almost sinks because he caught so many fish. And Peter knows in the moment, it's the first moment he's ever seen it, that Jesus is actually God. 
And when Peter actually is, knows that Jesus is actually God, Peter comes off onto the seashore and he falls down on his knees and he says, go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. Because when you know that God is in front of you, all of a sudden the weight of your own sin hits you. Amen. Isaiah did the same thing. He had this vision in the throne room of God and, and he said, I'm a man of unclean lips and I'm of a people of unclean lips because it wrecks you when you know. And it wrecked Saul, which is why he worshiped. There was a time that I was coming to church and I came on a Sunday morning and the day before I had fallen into sin, I'd fallen into old sin that God had already forgiven me for. And he'd forgiven me for it so many times. And I'm sitting in the row and the worship music is playing. And all I can see in my mind is my sin. And I felt so unworthy and unforgivable to be in church. And I couldn't sing. And God forgave me right there in that moment. He cleansed me right there in that moment. Not because my sin is small, but because he's big. I've told the story before. Somebody, this, this person came up to us at, in the prayer team after the service and, and they confessed to us that this was the first time that they had been to our church, but it was not the first time they had driven to our church. And they explained that they had driven to our church, parked their car in the parking lot, and because of their sense of their own sin, they couldn't come into the building. And they just stay there in the parking lot with the engine running while the service happened. And then they drove back home and they did that for multiple weeks in a row, just so convinced that they were beyond the help of God. And the day we prayed for them, they're like, I, I, I finally got in here. And this is real. Some of you guys have been to church so long, following Jesus so long, you forget how real this is. But this is real. It's not that your sin is small, it's that God is bigger. 1 John 1, 9 says, but if we confess our sins to him. And if you're a Christian today, you got to read this again, Okay. I know you've read it before. Some of you guys have memorized it. But if we confess our sins to him, he's faithful and he's just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. Hallelujah. If we take our sin to God, what does it say there? This is an incredible promise. God is faithful and just. Those two words are massive. What's he saying? He's faithful. What? Well, why? He's faithful because he already promised he'd forgive you. And if God promised it, he can't not do it. Amen. If he didn't, doesn't forgive you, he's a liar. And God cannot lie. Amen. So all he's doing when he forgives you is keeping his promise. That's, that's point number one. And then he's just to forgive you and cleanse you from all, un, all unrighteousness. Well, what does that mean? It means it's justice that God forgives you. Why is it justice? Because Jesus already died for your sins. When Jesus went to the cross, he died for all the sins of all humanity for all time. And if Jesus paid the debt that you owed for your guilt, which he did, and you've come to him and you've asked for that forgiveness, it is justice that God does it. Amen. If God would ever say no to you, God would be unjust because he would be asking you to pay a second time for the same sin. And God is not unjust. So God keeps his promises and keeps justice because Jesus already paid for you and that's how you get forgiven. And that's the way that it works. John three sixteen. again, read this with fresh eyes. Read it all over again. These are the words of Jesus, his most famous words. Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Jesus said, whoever. Well, what does that mean? That means whoever. Amen. That means everybody. Right. When Jesus used the word forever there, he said, no exceptions. That's what he's saying. Doesn't matter what you've done. Of course it matters, but it doesn't matter like that. It doesn't keep you out of the kingdom. Whoever would come to him and believe will be saved, he said. So all of a sudden, whoever means you. No matter what you think about it, no matter how noble you think you are, 
holding back from the mercy of God. He said, whoever, and he meant it. I told first service, I really wasn't ready for this this week, but I think this might be the, one of my favorite messages I've ever had the pleasure to give. Because as I've gotten to look in and really focus on Saul and really what all of this means, I don't think salvation has ever felt so big to me. I don't think Jesus has ever felt so big to me. I preached a funeral yesterday. When the day comes for my funeral, preach this one, all right? All right. It's a good one. John Newton, some of you guys know him. He wrote the song Amazing Grace. And his, song, his story's been told several times before. But he was a pastor until the day he died. And he, he wrote Amazing Grace, several other hymns, and, and known as this super spiritual man. But the first part of his life, he was in the slave trade in England. He was actually born into the slave trade. Um, his, his family was all invested in it. And he was so important in that trade, he captained several ships. He worked in it for decades of his life. It wasn't like he did it for a year and then like, you know, saw the light. Like, no, he spent a big part of his life doing this. And he was kind of a confused guy. John Newton, even when he, even when he finally found Jesus Christ and converted, um, he kept giving money to the slave trade and in, investing money in the slave trade. He wouldn't captain ships anymore. He didn't want to be that close to it, but he was still involved. And isn't that the way that we clumsily come to God? We don't change all at once. Amen. And he was that way. And then finally, he did come against it. Finally, he did realize what he had done. And it crushed him like it crushed Peter, like it crushed Saul. And when he said, amazing grace that saved a wretch like me, he meant it. He had this plaque put above his mantle at home. And he wanted it there so that he would be reminded every single day of his Christian life, what it was all about. And above the mantle, it said this, it said, and thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt. And a bondman means a slave. It says, and thou must remember that thou wast a bondman or a slave in the land of Egypt. And it's weird because you're like, John Newton, you weren't a slave. They were. But do you see what he's saying? He was a slave. And it's like God is saying, don't forget it. Every single day of your life, don't forget what you came from and what you got saved from because God is just that big. And then when he died, he actually pre-wrote out what was supposed to go on his tombstone, the inscription, because he didn't trust anybody else to write it for him. And I love that. And on his tombstone today, it says, John Newton Clerk, once an infidel, and a libertine, a servant of slaves in Africa, was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, preserved and restored and pardoned and appointed to preach the faith that he had long labored to destroy. If God could save John Newton, if God could save Saul, maybe he could save you, amen? amen. Uh, why don't you guys stand right now? We're gonna do a different thing. We don't do this very often, but it's a special day and I've got a conviction that God is in this, so we're gonna do it. I'm gonna give you an opportunity to come to the front. The band is gonna come and sing a song after I pray, but I have a conviction that many people in this room have business to do with God and it's been a long time since you've done business with God, had a moment with God, an interaction with God and there's things that you need to do first service, we just kind of filled up this front area. As full as we are second service, you might have to be two or three deep, and that's fine. We'll just figure it out. We've done it before. If you can't kneel, you just stand. That's fine. The rule is if you kneel and get down, we want you to be able to get back up. Amen? That's important. But wander up here and have your time with God and communicate that you're serious about what you're saying to him. 
ask him to meet you here. And here's who's gonna come today. Some of you who have believed that you are unsavable and unforgivable, you're gonna walk in faith today. And when I say walk in faith today, here's what I mean. Please, please keep listening. This is important. Courage is what people have when they're filled with fear. When you're filled with fear, you make a courageous decision. And your courageous decision does not make your fears go away. It's the decision you make in the midst of fear. Faith is the decision you make in the midst of doubts. It doesn't make your doubts go away. If you're full of doubts today and you're like, I'm not sure I believe, then you're perfect. Then this is you. Because faith is a decision you'll make today and God will take this tiny amount you bring in the physical realm and he'll add supernatural power to it in the spiritual realm. And that's how it's gonna work for you today. So you may not even believe today that you can be saved, but you still come and ask. And if you have been saved and you're like, I have been stuck in a place of guilt and I needed the reminder today that I am forgiven and that I can live in gratitude like Paul lived in gratitude, then you come and you rededicate yourself to the Lord and receive his forgiveness fresh. If you've stopped praying for somebody that you love because you lost hope in them and today God renewed your hope in them because if Saul can be saved, maybe your loved one can too, then you come and confess that lack of faith to God and ask him to change you. Ask him to set you back on that course, amen? Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for a big day. We thank you, Lord, that Jesus Christ is everything you ever said you would be. And so much bigger than maybe we thought you were. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your love for Saul. Thank you for your love for John Newton, God. Thank you for your love for us. Come and work in this time, Jesus. We give it to you. In Christ's name, amen.